Well, hey everybody. Like you said, my name is Ashley Parks. I'm a senior DevOps engineer at Toyota Connected North America. So you've probably heard of Toyota before, or Lexus, kind of the same thing. Toyota Connected is a small company in the Toyota umbrella. So we only have about 250 employees and we're helping transform Toyota from being just an automotive company to more of a mobility company with some really cool technology. I'll tell you about my project, but there's other divisions at Toyota that do some cool machine learning stuff with the vehicles. Um, they helped redesign the UI and the head units of the car. And to give you an impact of Toyota, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of them, <laughs> but just to give you an example, just in 2022 in the US alone, Toyota sold about two million vehicles. So big impact with the software we're making. So my project, we're DriveLink. We're a telematic service platform. You might know what that means, but I'm guessing a lot of you don't. Um, it's basically like OnStar, but for vehicles, uh, for Toyota and Lexus vehicles. We launched our platform August 5th, 2019. Like he said, I talked at Dash last year about what our platform was and how we launched. Um, today I'm gonna be talking more about the on-call process since we've launched, because um, we're still pretty successful. Um, so our, call, our platform, we have about six million vehicles on the road today that use it. Um, we are in the US, Canada, um, India, Australia, so we're all over the place. <laughs> we take about 3,000 calls a day and the breakdown of those calls are 50% are destination assist calls. Um, these aren't emergency calls at all. Um, it's when somebody is driving their car and they don't know where to go, they can contact a call center agent to talk to a real life person or an AI person um, to get directions to where they wanna go. We also have 30, 36, 40% subscription calls. These are people activating the different flags um, or waiving their services if they don't want to have their data. And then the emergency side, thankfully it's not a lot of the calls, uh, but we need to be 100% available for them. We have 8% are SOS, so that's somebody pressing the button that's in the vehicle. And 5% of that are the automatic collision notifications. So what that is, is when the vehicle gets into an accident and the airbag is deployed, or some other sensor tells us that there was an accident with this vehicle, they'll automatically get connected to our call center. And then our call center has information about where they are on the road, how fast they were going, um, and then contact 911 if they need. So we are broken up. Uh, we have about 30 people. That's our team photo. <laughs> uh, we're broken up into five different teams. We have the provisioning team. So they're the team that handles all the data when the vehicle is created in the factory. When it gets to the dealership, different things are turned on. And when it's finally told, sold to an end user customer, um, more flags will be turned on or off, depending on what the customer wants. Then we have the safety services team. This is the team that's responsible for um, coding updates to our safety services platform, because with each model year of a vehicle, certain things about the specification change. So our safety services team helps with updating the code for that. Then we have the DevOps team, that's me. <laughs> our team, we're about five people, and we help make sure that the infrastructure is up 99.99% of the time. Then we have tech ops. They are our first line of defense for any incidents or tickets that come into our system. So it could be just Toyota themselves telling us about, hey, the specific vehicle's having a problem. Or they're also, when a Datadog monitor goes off, they'll be the first one monitoring that channel, doing the first initial triaging before they page out to an engineering team. And finally, we have our all important service ops team. They're the team that helps train our call center agents, making sure they're really capable of answering emergency calls, because that's a very stressful situation. Um, and they also let us know if there's something on the Salesforce side, which is what the call center agents see. If there's something broken with that, they'll let us know. So now let's talk about on call. Um, so there are some problems with on call because everyone that is on call hates it, you know? Um, so let's talk about why. So the first one is unknown failures. This is if there's something breaking in your platform and you don't know about it, you probably won't know until everything's on fire. So you wanna know when something's broken as soon as possible so you can fix it before it becomes an outage. Next, monitor fatigue. This is, you have that monitoring channel, it's busy with everything that's flapping all the time so you never know if something's actually broken which leads into this one, knowing when things are actually broken. So this is any false positives that are in your system, not helpful whatsoever when you're on call, because it's like crying wolf. You'll see that go off and you're like, eh, that went off yesterday, it's probably fine. What if it's not? <laughs> so then 
knowing who to page. So our tech ops team, when they see a monitor come in, they need to know which engineering team to talk to um, to figure out who can fix this problem. So if they page the wrong team, that person will, will, will be woken up, they'll be groggy, they'll look at the incident and be like, I don't actually know how to fix this, this isn't my service. Then you have to page another team and that just wastes time when things could be burning and uh, not great. And finally, being woken up at two o'clock in the morning to fix something, not fun whatsoever. What you really want to be like oh, is when you're on call and you don't get any alerts whatsoever. That's the ideal. Now, it's not gonna happen 100% of the time, but I will help you figure out how to fine tune your monitors and use all sorts of cool Datadog offerings so that when you're on call, it's not super stressful. First way is knowing the difference between anomaly and threshold monitors. They each have their ideal scenarios, but you need to be, make sure that the metrics that you're putting into monitors are tuned in a way that is actually helpful. So what type of monitor do you need? The first type is threshold. This has a precise boundary and simple and well-defined metrics. So this is, for example, this graph here. It's a metric that tells us the time it takes for a call to happen. So we have an SLA where all of the calls, when somebody presses a button, it'll get to a call center agent within three seconds. That's a simple metric to set a threshold alert for. If it's greater than three seconds, send them an alert. That's bad. However, there's also anomaly. These are for patterns of metrics. Um, so it can help determine if there's a DDoS attack or there's some random outlier with whatever metric you're looking at. They're pretty cool, very useful, but you don't want them 100% of the time with all of your metrics. Um, this graph that I have here is our um, ingress traffic. So as you can see, during the daytime, we have a lot of traffic. At night, there's less people driving around, um, so we have less traffic. Now, Datadog is pretty cool. They let you define more things about your anomalies. I'm not a machine learning engineer, so I don't know a lot about this, <laughs> but these are the three different types of anomaly algorithms that Datadog lets you use. The first one is basic, so this is metrics without seasonality, and its machine learning algorithm is a lagging rolling quantile. So this is for metrics that probably won't change a lot depending on day-to-day -day usage, um, but it is something that you can't really define a well-defined threshold because it might change a little bit. Then you have agile and robust. These are both seasonally, uh, seasonal uh, anomaly metrics. So the first one uses something called Serima, and the second one is a seasonal trend decomposition. So to help you figure out what that means, because <laughs> one of them, agile is metrics that are expected to change over time, and robust is they're pretty stable. They're probably not gonna change. So what that means, as you can see in the bottom, the one on the left is robust and the other one's agile. So this metric, it's monitoring something over a week and over on the weekend, the traffic or whatever this is drops down. Now you can see the agile one, it quickly adjusts to that drop down, whereas the robust, it still thinks it's an alert state for a couple more days. So this could be, say you are deploying an infrastructure fix or some code fix and that changes this metrics um, like what the metric shows. So the Agile will be able to more quickly adjust to the new metrics values. So here's an example of one of our threshold monitors. It's that one that I had the picture of before. So it's the above three seconds, that's a problem. So you can see our query, it's a custom metric. It checks the request received to case upsert duration. If it's greater than 3,001 milliseconds, that's not good. <laughs> so it will send an alert to our PG monitor alert channel. And it also has an attached runbook. Runbooks are very important, especially if you have a tier one support team or even just you in the middle of the night when you wake up, you may have forgotten how to even be an engineer. Um, so a runbook will help you figure out the steps to, to resolve your incident. So always include those on any important monitors for you. And then our next one, is one of our anomaly monitors. This one is a little bit more complicated. <laughs> it's us monitoring our direct connect traffic. So we use AWS Direct Connect for our ingress point to our clusters. So this one, we're using the agile seasonality um, with five robustness, and it's uh, daily. It is gonna automatically page our infrastructure team if that goes off, because if that is anomalous of some sort, that's probably not great. <laughs> and then it also is gonna send an alert to one of our alert Slack channels. This one unfortunately doesn't have a runbook. That's something we are going through and cleaning up and adding runbooks to everything, but just to show you, we aren't perfect either. <laughs> Next, we have Watchdog. 
This was talked about a little bit this morning in the keynote. It's really cool. Um, it's kind of a machine learning thing that Datadog has made for performance, infrastructure metrics, different logs, all different Datadog security things. Um, it will automatically be looking at all the metrics that you put into Datadog and trying to figure out patterns for you. So some examples of times that this has helped us, the first one, correlation of latency in some services. So this watchdog alert went off when we were migrating our messaging platform from um, Azure Service Bus into RabbitMQ. We thought everything was great. The logs looked fine. Our testing was working. Curls were working fine. We have some fake vehicles that we can press buttons on. Um, those were all fine. However, watchdog was like, hey, these three services, they're a little bit latent. You should probably look at that. And that's something that we probably would have caught later on down the road when like the CPU spiked or something happened or those pods crashed. But Watchdog was able to tell us these services were latent before we would have ever known. So that was very useful. Next, this one is one that goes off probably the most. Um, it's an increase of error logs in specific services. So this happens. Um, we're very agile, so we don't have big releases that happen all the time. So different teams can deploy image updates whenever they want. So this goes off pretty, I mean, not all the time, but when somebody deploys a new image and there's some sort of error happening, say there's a race condition they didn't think of, Watchdog will immediately tell them, hey, there's an error log in this specific service, you should look at that. And it'll even tell you what exact uh, log message is firing. Next, we have latent MongoDB queries. So this one is connected to Datadog APM. So kind of expanding on that first point, say that you have tracing enabled in your services and you can see like the overall trace seems to be totally fine. It's not very latent, but it notices that MongoDB queries inside of different traces are increasing. Uh, Watchdog will let you know about that too. That's probably not something that you'll already have defined on your own, um, so very helpful. And here's a nice screenshot of one of those error log. Um, so you can see in our provisioning configuration service, um, the error message increased to 120 uh, logs per minute. And you can see the exact log message that was going off. And so our developers were able to quickly see that, roll back that image and fix it locally. This was also in our staging environment as well. So this is some examples of what this, the pictures of the different watchdog alerts look like. Uh, it's really easy to set these up inside of Datadog. You go to like new monitor and then watchdog is one of the, the options. Um, but you can set them up per Datadog service. So this is our infrastructure one, APM, and logs. So they all look really similar, um, except the story category is different for each one. But we have them limited to a story category and then we have these alerts just for our production environment. Um, Watchdog itself in the UI will go off with other um, environments, but we only have them sending to Slack channels when it's production. And finally, my favorite feature. <laughs> um, this was announced at Datadog last year at Dash. Um, so this is something we, we saw at the keynote. We went back home, we were like, we really need to do this. This is super cool. Um, so Datadog workflow automation, if you haven't messed with it before, it's a way to automate processes. So your tier one support team will have to do less. Um, it helps you speed up different things. It'll automatically reach out to different infrastructure tools that you have, do things for you, so you don't have to wake up in the middle of the night and do really boring stuff. Um, they also have some predefined blueprints. If you don't really know what to use Watchdog or what to use workflows for, they have a couple of blueprints in there to help you get your brain flowing. A really cool one that we can't implement because the way our, our infrastructure is, but um, a cool way to block specific IP addresses. So say you're getting DDoS by a specific IP, you can have workflow go in and block that IP automatically for you. Pretty cool. Our use case is a process that checks our OCSP stapling. And it's kind of a flappy service. I'm not gonna go into what OCSP stapling is because <laughs> it's PKI, very complicated, but we basically have a little pod that's running in our cluster and making sure that certificates are valid. Um, but it's a little tiny Go app that we made. It's really small um, and it just, it sometimes doesn't work. And to fix it, we just have to restart it. I mean, turn it off, turn it back on again, it fixes it. It's not like a mission critical um, actual code process, it's just a little tiny, uh, basically cron job that's running. However, if this is actually broken, that's a big deal. <laughs> it means vehicles can't communicate with us. But it was going off at like one o'clock in the morning, we would just wake up, restart that pod, and then go back to sleep, and everything was totally fine. Um, so we were like, this would be a great use case for workflows. So how did we implement this? 
So we have that little OCSP failure detecting pod deployed inside of our Kubernetes cluster. It will trigger the Datadog monitor just like it did before. But now, instead of just automatically paging us, it's gonna talk to Datadog workflow, trigger that off, send a message into our Slack channel saying, hey, I'm gonna restart this pod for you just so you're aware that Datadog's doing something. So it's gonna restart that pod for us. If it's actually broken, then it'll page us. If it's not broken, we get to enjoy our sleep. So this is that troublesome, troublesome monitor that goes off, just a little screenshot. So as you can see before, this screenshot's a little bit different than all the others that I've had so far. Instead of the recipient being a Slack channel, the recipient is the Datadog workflow. So that's pretty easy. That's how you trigger um, some workflows, just automatically when a monitor fires, it's gonna do stuff for you. So the other problem we had to figure out is how to restart that Kubernetes pod. Because Datadog does have a whole bunch of actions that are able to connect to AWS, connect to all these different cloud offerings, but since we are using EKS and this is a deployment inside of there, it's kind of hard for Datadog to figure out how to go that deep into your infrastructure. But we use this tool called Argo CD. It's pretty cool. Um, it's our deployment tool. All of our developers have access to this. Um, it's basically like a pretty UI on top of K9s. Um, so we're able to change authentication depending on if you're a developer, if you're on the DevOps team. You can go in here and you can view logs for specific pods also, it's pretty cool. Um, so we were like, oh, we use Argo CD. I wonder if they have like an API that we could use workflow to call that API and do stuff for us. Turns out we can. So we created a little Datadog user inside of our Argo CD deployment, gave it a token, and then we gave that token to Datadog workflows and used that HTTP request to be able to restart a specific deployment for us. So this is a video of what our workflow looks like. Let's see if it's, there it goes. So first of all, it has a trigger. It's like an at mention of how to start your workflow. This is our HTTP request that's talking to Argo CD. Um, so you can see it has a request body of restart. And then it's gonna send that Slack message saying, hey, we're gonna restart a deployment for you. Then it's gonna wait five minutes. This is just so that pod has time to restart, recheck that OCSP stapling. Then we're gonna get the monitor again, see if it's still in alert state. There's the alert state. So if it's not an alert state, we're gonna just notify that Slack channel and say, hey, Datadog fixed this problem for us. You're totally cool. But if it is an alert state, we're gonna go ahead and create a Datadog incident, which is something also really cool. Um, assign it to our tier one support team lead and also automatically page our infrastructure team. So this was really cool. It saved us a couple times. Thankfully, it hasn't triggered itself that much, which means our little OCSP monitor pod is pretty healthy and nice. But if it does actually try and go off, this does flow. It's really useful. We don't get waking up at one in the, one in the morning. Um, so in conclusion, how to optimize your on-call um, lifestyle. <laughs> First step is to tune your monitors. This is something that we are constantly reevaluating. We actually set up a meeting once a week to go through our most triggered monitors and reevaluate their thresholds, figure out if the anomaly needs to be messed with a little bit, fine tuned, and this is just a way to help reduce noise and actually know when things are broken. Also, whenever there is an RCA from an incident, that's usually one of our action items in the RCA is to either set up an alert or make sure that alert is useful. Like, why didn't it fire if it was supposed to? Utilize all available tooling to help. Um, this is related to watchdog, workflows, anything that can help you when you're on call, do it. Because you don't wanna waste your time as an engineer doing really boring stuff. You wanna actually do the cool development, you know? So you wanna use as much as possible to help your on-call life. And automate easy solutions. This is a great way to speed up time to resolution on incidents and to just have a better lifestyle. Like, I mean, have the robots do it. Let me do the cool stuff. So thank you so much. Uh, if you're interested in Toyota Connected, we have careers posted all the time. Um, there aren't any right now. There's a testing engineering one, but that's it. But we're constantly hiring people, so yay. <laughs> Thank you.
that was super cool, uh, especially the workflow. That's a really awesome workflow that I think a lot of people would be super psyched to have. Um, we have some time for questions. Does anybody have questions? I can throw this really cool microphone in a box at you. I see some hands already awesome. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I have a question about workflows. How do you manage your workflows like at scale? Do you have like just one or two that you manage or like what if, what if you start growing your work? Like what is the scope of your workflow uh, usage and how do you manage like tens or hundreds of? Workflows? We don't have that many yet. We actually okay. only have two in production right now, but we were talking to some workflow engineers while we were here. We're gonna have like a workflow session, kind of like a workflow-a-thon, a hackathon, but for workflows so we can make a whole bunch more and get because there's some other scenarios that the developers know about that I don't necessarily know, like, oh, this is that process they go through when they get paged. So they know about it, but our DevOps team doesn't. So they can create some cool workflows and yeah. Can I subscribe to your newsletter? Because that's, that's my problem too. It's like, yeah. how, do I, how do I scale up these, this usage of workflows? Yeah, I mean, really I'd say, just send out the information to your other teams and be like, this is a really cool thing. Are there like boring stuff that you do or things that are very repetitive for you or an easy problem to solve, try and implement it. Because the, the user interface is really easy to use. Um, the only kind of difficult thing is the like connections and tokens. That was probably the hardest part of setting ours up was figuring out how to get an Argo CD token for it. Um, but I mean, I think the developers would have fun making them. <laughs> That's okay. why we're gonna try and do like a hackathon. Cool. Yeah. Oh, I suck at this, okay. Uh, so when it comes to automation, my primary skepticism is always like, well, what if the automation fails, right? So is there some sort of mechanism to say if your Argo CD token expires, uh, what happens then? That did happen to us, actually. And Datadog will send you an error message. Um, we have one that manually triggers to restart a pod. And the people pressing that restart button were like, it's broken, please help us. Um, so the way that we kind of know if it's broken is you saw I had the Slack message that, hey, Datadog is triggering this off. If there isn't an end state, so if we don't see a message that like, hey, Datadog fixed this or it made an incident, we know it probably broke somewhere along the way. So that's the way we kind of figured it out is we have it tell us something's happening way at the beginning of the workflow and then check and make sure that the end state actually occurred. Well, is there, is there a way to configure a failback though? Say for example, if you said, hey, if that if you've actually got an error, mm -hmm. uh, go to pager duty or something like that. Is there that option? I don't know. I think there should be. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't actually know if that you is watch the way. watchdog, right? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Anybody else? Oh, see one there. Thank you. Um, when it comes to managing of monitors, um, do you find that it's better to like allow teams to self-serve the monitors, or would or do you think it's better to have it stored in something like Terraform and manage through that? We're sort of torn between both at the minute, and we're not really sure which route to go down. So I'd just like to get your thoughts on it. Yeah, we have all of our monitors inside of Terraform, um, and we actually a couple weeks ago had a KT session with our developers to go over how to add them in Terraform because we noticed some of them were getting made just in Datadog themselves, and that kind of messes up with our tagging, so it's harder to filter. So we um, really would like to push all of our developers to make them inside of Terraform so that they all get tagged the way we want with the environment tag, a service tag, all that, so it shows up in Datadog in an easily filterable way. Um, but that's also a problem that we've had as well. Good, thank you. Hi, uh, this might be a little bit inside Toyota. Uh, Hi. You uh, said you did your updates whenever you, the developers wanted, is that right? Yeah, we're very agile, so. Uh, does that cause any downtime? Because of what? Does it cause any downtime? Since, so we have a whole bunch of microservices. Um, so usually when somebody releases an image, um, if it does happen to break that specific image, um, it won't affect our entire platform. So that's something we like about agile development is it's not changing everything all at once. It'll just change one specific service. But we also have a ton of redundancy in our platform. So we have multi-clusters. Um, we have a backup flow. So if a call comes in, it'll, if something doesn't work and we aren't able to communicate with the vehicle our main way, there is a backup way where it'll text the vehicle. So we have backups in place. If something rogue does happen and a service goes down for some reason, um, we should always be able to connect the vehicle to the call center. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah. 
And so the workflow feature, is mm -hmm. it out of the box? Or um, because I don't see it in the product that we have. It is. Um, so it was beta last year when they announced it at Dash, but I'm pretty sure it's GA. I think the cost of it, I think it's I, like per 100 runs, it's like $10. Okay, so it's an add-on then, yeah? It's an add-on. It's an add-on? Yes, okay. it's an add-on you have to enable, I think. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay, got it. Hi, you said like the, the DDoS, DDoS attacks can be prevented with the workflows, right? So Sorry. the DDoS attacks, the DDoS attacks. DDoS attacks, yes. Can be prevented with workflows, right? So is it kind of a automated thing? Or yeah. every time you just go block or prevent it? That's something that we really want to set up. Um, the way our AWS infrastructure is, we haven't figured out an exact way to do that yet. So he's wondering about um, how to prevent DDoS, DDoS attacks with workflows. But Datadog has a blueprint um, that talks about that. If you use their security tooling, it can determine like specific IP addresses that are being bad actors. Um, and it'll connect up to your infrastructure, however you connect that way, and trigger it off in WAF to say, hey, don't let these IPs into your system. It's really cool. We want to enable that workflow, but we need to figure out an alternate way to do it in ours. Uh, you had said that you had a weekly meeting to review uh, recurring alerts. Um, can you just walk us through what that meeting looks like? Is it a threshold that you guys all agree upon to fudge the thresholds, or is it uh, a collaborative experience? And it's like, yeah. we all vote, yeah, let's raise it or lower it. Uh, just walk us through that. That's really interesting meeting concept. Yeah, it's a, it's a fun meeting. So it's every Thursday. Um, it's just with our team. So we want to kind of replicate that into our developer teams as well. But on the DevOps team that we do, there's only five of us, so it's pretty collaborative. What we'll do is we will, there's a dashboard that I think Datadog automatically creates for you that shows all of your Datadog monitors and how often they've triggered. So we filter that to our production environment and we just go down that list and we will screen share and fix that monitor while we're on the call. So then that just knocks some of them out while we're there. We don't have to create Jira tickets and have people work on them later. We just get done right there and it's fun. <laughs> I like playing them day to <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm really curious, like, tech debt's always hard to burn down, right? But if you hide it behind a workflow and it restarts the container for you, like, how do you still prioritize it? Like, it, it almost goes out of mind. So, like, what's the cycle to still go back and look at that service and make it less flaky? Yeah. So I think what we are going to do is implement it into that monitor review meeting, check and make sure like, because you can see how many times your workflows have fired as well. So go through and see this workflow has fired this many times. We should probably take a look and see why it's doing that, why we need to repart restart that pod so often. Um, so just as something that you have to review every now and then, unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> it's, it becomes a culture problem, right? Yeah. Prioritization is hard. <laughs> Any other questions? Anybody else got something they're curious about? So. I recently found uh, anomaly monitors. I've been implementing them uh, a lot recently. And I've found that sort of in absence of an SLA where you have a strict number to adhere to, mm -hmm. um, I I'm finding them just, just a lot more useful than thresholds. Where, where do you find that thresholds, uh, if you don't have like an explicit agreement to say you're serving that, uh, that level, um, wh when do you find that thresholds are still uh, like better than anomalies? Yeah, that's a good question. I also tend to lean towards using anomalies, but thresholds are still useful. Um, there's one where we track the number of HTTP like error codes. So if our error codes are more than like 50, if we get 50 errors within the past hour, that's probably not great. So we have an anomaly set up for that as well, but we also wanna know there's something that might be going wrong, like there might be some problem with a couple of VINs or something that they're having some sort of issue with this endpoint tend to take a look at it. Um, but it's more of a lower priority issue than if an anomaly fires that's using that same sort of metric goes off, if that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, yeah that, that works. Um, I, I think I had one more thing. Um, yeah, I think you answered it earlier, though. Uh, with the workflow, uh, if it is unsuccessful, does the, a different monitor fire telling you it wasn't successful, or do you have to manually see that it didn't complete? I think you have to manually see. Okay. That's something I'm not entirely sure of, actually. <laughs> All right, sounds good, thank you. Okay. All right, anybody else? Okay, let's give a big round of applause for, this is an awesome talk.